to gather with God's people. But the world often says uh, that life just happens. But uh, our God tells us in his word that that's not true. He is in the heavens, and he is working out his perfect plan of redemption for this world, and he intends to do that in and through his church, in and through the gatherings of his church. So I am personally excited to be here this morning. I trust that if you're a Christian, if you're a member of this church, that's true uh, of you. If you're a visitor, we are so glad that you are with us. I trust someone has welcomed you. Please uh, receive my welcome now. Uh, we are always uh, delighted to have visitors with us. Um, if you can, don't rush off after the service. We'd love to get to know you. I hope to be in the lobby afterwards. I'd love to meet you, hear how we can serve you uh, with the gospel. Um, there's also a Connect card in the pew. You should find one there. Uh, fill that out. Uh, hand it into uh, somebody at the door uh, or in the offering box, uh, and we'd love to uh, know of your visit, know of your, 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 your presence with us this morning, and see how we can, we can serve you. Perhaps you've been coming for a number of weeks or months, uh, and you are wanting to find out what the next step is. Perhaps you want to become part of this church formally. Uh, I would draw your attention to what's happening in late October. Uh, in the bulletin, you'll find uh, details about that. Castleview 101. In uh, late October, over three Wednesdays, we'll be having classes, five classes, well, over three Wednesday nights, uh, that will orientate you and introduce you to what it means to be a member here, uh, what this church believes, what we expect from each other. Uh, so, Cast of You 101, if you want to take the next step in becoming a member of this church, joining yourself formally to us. Perhaps you just want to know more about the church. Those are great classes to go and sit in on. Uh, we cover the statement of faith, the church covenant, and other things. It'll help you uh, orientate yourself to who we are and what we uh, believe. In the meantime, let me just encourage you as a visitor to just keep coming. Uh, you're always welcome here. Let me draw your attention to our evening service. We meet at 6.30, on, uh, 5.30, 5.30 uh, on Sunday evenings for prayer. Um, the focus is on prayer as we hear even a brief time of God's, from God's word and some prayer requests and some updates. Uh, uh, the focus is on prayer. So come to this evening again at 5.30. Members, I want to encourage you to come this evening. As you know, two of your elders were away uh, in uh, Addis Ababa uh, visiting the Grangers. Um, Michael and Kanon send their greetings. Jordan uh, and I got back yesterday safely. Jordan will be here tonight to give an update and give you some highlights of uh, our trip. Some other announcements to bring to your attention. You can see there are some say the date uh, um, information in the back of your bulletin. Please take note of that. Women's Retreat and Men's Fellowship Evening. This coming Saturday, will be the uh, funeral service for Jacob Lynn. So please make note uh, to be there. 12 o'clock will be the, the uh, visitation. And at 2 o'clock, at 2 p.m. this coming Saturday will be the memorial service. It would be an encouragement to them for us all to be there. So please uh, mark your calendar. Lastly, as you can see, we have the table set out. We will conclude our service this morning gathered around the table as a church. So I would encourage you to use uh, all the elements that we will enjoy together, singing, praying, to prepare your heart to meet with, your, with God's people and even with the Lord himself around the table. Let me give you some time now to prepare your heart, to speak to your Lord quietly as we prepare to worship him together. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. As we gather like this every week, the Lord calls us to encourage one another. One of the chief ways we do that is by singing, by singing heartily and loudly to our God and even to each other. I want to draw your attention to the first uh, hymn. Uh, the third verse is printed on page one. Why don't you turn there quickly? I want to just read to you um, the third verse. He, that is God, breaks the power of canceled sin. He sets the prisoner free. 
His blood can make the foulest clean. His blood availed, availed for me. So let's encourage each other as we sing. Please stand. Sing my great Redeemer's praise, the glories of my God and King, the triumphs of His grace, my gracious Master and my God, assist me to proclaim, to spread through all the earth abroad the honors of the Jesus, the name that charms our fears, that bids our sorrows cease. Tis music in the sinner's ears, tis life in hell. And listening to his voice, new life the dead receive. The mournful, broken hearts rejoice, the humble poor believe. Glory to God and praise and love be ever, ever given by saints below and saints above. The You may be seated. Money, money can often present itself as a rival God, bidding us to put our hope in it instead of our God. In fact, some have wandered from the faith because of their cravings for wealth. But our God is patient and kind He reminds us both of the dangers of loving money and of the blessings of being generous with our finances towards Him uh, and His cause. This is what we find in our scripture reading this morning, 1 Timothy chapter 6. You'll find it in the Pew Bible on page 933. It's also printed in your bulletin. So let's continue to honor our God even as we hear His Word read to us. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and Our brother Jeff Strickland is going to read God's word for us. First Timothy chapter six, verse three. If anyone teaches a different doctrine, there we go. First Timothy chapter six, verse three. If anyone teaches a different doctrine and does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness, he is puffed up with conceit and understands nothing. He has an unhealthy craving for controversy and for quarrels about words, which produce envy, dissension, slander, evil suspicions, and constant friction among people who are depraved in mind and deprived of the truth imagining that godliness is a means of gain. But godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this, con- this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. Moving on to verse 17. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, 
nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up for themselves treasure as a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. Let's praise our God together in prayer. Infinite God and Heavenly Father, you are all-powerful, all-good, and all-wise. You alone know what's best for us, want what's best for us, and can do what's best for us. We praise you this morning, Lord, for your incomparable generosity. You are indeed the God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. You, Father, are truly the giver of every good and perfect gift. What a gift your creation is to enjoy. The beauty of an Indiana fall, the calm of a rainy morning, the splendor of a morning sunrise, and the refreshment of an afternoon breeze. And what gifts you give us out of your creation. The variety and deliciousness of food and drink, a hot bowl of hearty soup or the soothing sip of a warm beverage, like the birds of the air and the flowers of the field, you nourish us, clothe us, and shelter us. All are good gifts that proclaim your handiwork and declare your glory. They are but dim reflections of your beauty, warmth, peace, and joy. We delight in these gifts, but we praise you, our magnificent creator and sustainer. And yet these earthly goods are not even the pinnacle of what you have created. You created us, knitting us together in your image so that we might reflect and represent you to this world and to each other. We praise you, Lord, for your kindness and not leaving Adam alone. We rejoice in your wise, gracious gift of one another. It is you, our God, who designed the intimacy of marriage and the unity of family. It is you who has given us the faithfulness of friendships and the cheer of close companions. It is you, Lord, who has brought us into your family, the church, a growing people of every tribe, tongue, and nation that is made real even now in our gathering together this morning. We praise you for these brothers and sisters who share our burdens and our joys, who sorrow in our sufferings, help in our hardships, and celebrate our successes. These relationships are but imperfect expressions of your perfect care and compassion for us, your people. They are but a sample of your unblemished glories to come. We enjoy all of these gifts you have so richly provided only in and through the one who is your greatest gift. Father, we praise you most of all for sending your son, Jesus, to us. We marvel that Jesus, being fully God, became fully human, that he stepped into our shoes and did for us what we could not do for ourselves. He loved you and others where we loved only ourselves. He remained faithful where we failed, and he gave his life to save ours. He died so that we might live. He experienced the utter depths of sorrow so that we might know the utter heights of joy. Truly, Jesus is the good and perfect gift that transforms all other gifts from gods to goods. We enjoy nothing except that which has come through his nail-scarred hands. Father, we praise you for sending your spirit to open our hearts to see your goodness and the glory of your son. We ask that your spirit teach us, strengthen us, help us to never exalt the gift over you, the giver, nor worship the created over you, the creator. May we always and ever praise you, our generous triune God, for the riches of your provision know no end. Surely we rejoice to proclaim, the Lord is our shepherd. We have no want. In Christ we pray, amen.
How do you know if you're a Christian? What's a mark of someone who has been regenerated by the Spirit? Well, here's one mark. To be a Christian means to have knowledge that our greatest problem is our sinfulness before a holy God. Uh, It's not our lack of good health, of friends, of a happy marriage. It's not our lack of food and clothing. Our greatest problem is our sinfulness before a holy God. And so we rejoice. We rejoice at the good news that Jesus has paid the debt for all our sin. Uh, We take great joy uh, in the good news that Christ has become our great hope in life and death. This is what we sing about in our next two songs. Uh, They are printed on page three and four. So let's stand and sing again. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. And Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Lord, now indeed I find Thy power and Thine alone Can change the leper's spots And melt the heart of stone And Jesus paid it all Jesus died my soul to save, my lips shall still repeat, Jesus paid, and Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe, sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow.
What is our hope in life and death? Christ alone, Christ alone. What is our only confidence that our souls to Him belong? Who holds our days within His hand? What comes apart from His command? And what will keep us to the end? The Truth can calm the troubled soul. Oh, God is good. God is good. Where is His grace and goodness known? In our great Redeemer's blood, who holds our faith when fears arise, who stands above the stormy trial. Who sends the waves that bring us nigh unto the shore, the rock of Christ? Oh, sing a hallelujah, our hope springs eternal. Oh, sing Unto the grave, what shall we sing? Oh, Christ, he lives, Christ, he lives. And what reward will heaven bring? Oh, everlasting life with him. And we will rise to meet the Lord when sin and death. When Christ is ours forevermore, oh, sing a hallelujah, our hope springs eternal, oh, sing hallelujah, now and ever we confess, Christ our hope and life and death. Sing that again. Oh, sing. Oh, sing a hallelujah. Our hope springs eternal. Oh, sing hallelujah. Now and ever we confess Christ our hope in life and death. Amen. Continue. You can be seated. Let's continue to worship our God uh, by bringing our requests to this generous Father that we have. Let's pray. Father, you uh, have allowed us to know you, our Creator, through your Son, Jesus Christ. To have sins forgiven, to have life everlasting in him, to have your spirit so that we can have communion with you. And so we have an eternal hope that we sing of and we celebrate. We also know that uh, there's so much that is wrong in us and in our world. So we pray for your mercy and for your grace that we are confident comes only from you. God, we pray 
uh, for your help for the leaders that you've placed over us. We think of uh, President Biden, Vice President Harris, or Senator Schumer, and Senator McConnell, Speaker Pelosi. God, we pray that you would help these uh, national leaders uh, to serve for the good of the people. We pray that the consciences that you've given them would restrain evil and commend righteousness. We ask that you'd give them wisdom and strength and courage to do what is right. And uh, any places where they make foolish choices, we pray that you would use these even for good. That you would make them to bring about your glory and the good of your people. God, we trust that you alone can do this, so we ask that you would. Father, we pray for uh, those who live among us or throughout our nation who are refugees for immigrant communities, and we pray that you would have mercy on them, that Christians and churches would display to them a unique love that is only possible through Christ. We pray uh, that as you bring us into contact with people from other places, other nations, in our jobs, in our neighborhoods, that you would open our hearts to them and that we would then open our lives our homes to them as well. And we pray that through that, many would become citizens of heaven. God, we pray for uh, the work of the gospel in other parts of the world. Thank you for Josh and Julie serving in Turkey. We ask that you would bless the ministry of the word, especially in their local church and then moving outward throughout the nation to other churches. We pray that the Christians there who live in uh, many of them difficult circumstances, many of them with the threat of persecution in small and big ways, that they would grow, that they would mature in the faith, that they would have strength from you that looks like perseverance and patience and joy and love. Father, we pray for the good of uh, the churches in and around our area. We think of Plainfield Baptist Church, for Jared Skinner, the pastor there. We pray that you would uh, bless that church even this morning, that you would bring new Christians and new families into that body of Christ. Pray especially for Jared, that you would help him to trust you in the ups and downs of ministry, that he would be a faithful farmer sowing seed and going to sleep and waking up and doing it again and trusting you to bring life, to bring growth. God, we pray for our own church family. Uh, we ask that you would be at work in our midst, that you would not leave us to ourselves, that you would not even leave us to our own desires where those desires are shaped by our flesh and not by you. We pray that we would, uh, though it's not natural to us, that we would be a people devoted to prayer, that we would come to you often, daily as individual members, uh, weekly as we gather as your church. We pray that as we pray to you, we would be a people who are uh, marked by thankfulness, that our hearts would be overflowing with thanks in each of your gifts. Now we think of uh, the individual members this morning, of uh, Karen Bittner, that you would help her to see and rejoice in all the ways you take care of her and most of all how you have sent your son for her. For our sister Barbara Brocker, that she would have health and strength, that she would uh, continue as she uh, enjoys decades of following after Christ, that she would continue to grow in godliness. We pray for our sister Barbara Brinson, that you would give her grace to persevere in faith and love and to know with confidence your love for her. We pray for Larry uh, Brokaw or Pam Brokaw, that you would, you would grant to them a settled contentment in you and in all the things you give them. Father, we pray that we would have hearts that are soft, hearts of flesh, hearts that are responsive to your word and your spirit, that as you speak to us through the word, we would hear your voice, we would listen, and we would obey. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll sing one more hymn before uh, Nathan brings God's word to us. It's on page three, page 
5 of your bulletin. Why do you turn there? I want to draw your attention again to verse 3. Uh, the second half of verse 3, it speaks of our great and bright future as Christians. I will glory in my Redeemer who waits for me at gates of gold. And when he calls me, it will be paradise. His face forever to behold. His face forever to behold. As we sing our next hymn, children in kindergarten are dismissed to their classes. Let's stand and sing together. I will glory in my Redeemer, whose priceless blood has ransomed me. Mine was the sin that drove the bitter nails and hung him on that judgment tree. And I will glory in my Redeemer, who crushed the fire. I will glory in my Redeemer, my life he bought, my love he owns. I have no longings for another, I'm satisfied in him alone. And I will glory in my Redeemer, his faithfulness. forever to behold. You may be seated. Some of you uh, may remember the 1960s when, among many more significant factors, Superman pajamas were sold. Superman in the 60s was at the height of his popularity, as I understand it. And a countless number of American boys asked their parents to have a pair of Superman pajamas. One of those boys, Bill Mayhew, years later said, I practically lived in those Superman pajamas because I was convinced that I would obtain superpowers that way. The manufacturer was aware of this possibility, so it printed on a label inside, only Superman can fly. It's important for little boys to know that when they put those pajamas on. Only Superman can fly. And another little boy at the time who was seven, a little boy named Carl, said that when he read the label, he said, I was very disappointed. That's not what he was hoping for. Unrealistic expectations can spoil good things. When we have wrong expectations that something is going to be more than what it really is, it can ruin what is otherwise a good thing. There was nothing wrong with these Superman pajamas. They did exactly what they were designed to do. They made little boys look somewhat like Superman. 
But for those who are hoping to gain superpowers, ah, man, big disappointment. In Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 5 and 6, where we are this morning, the author warns against the common, misplaced, unrealistic expectations that we have in money, in the things that money can buy. We think that they will satisfy us, that they will make us happy. And so we set our hearts on them. We set our hearts on having what we don't yet have, on getting more. The main thing we're going to notice in the passage this morning, the main point of this sermon is this. If you set your heart on money, and we could add, and possessions and any earthly good, if you set your heart on money, you will be disappointed. Only God can give us joy. If you set your heart on money, you will be disappointed. Only God can give us joy. Or if you want it in just four words, loving money never pays. A summary of our passage, we have um, a, a few more verses than we had last week. In chapter 5, verses 8 and 9, you have that printed in your bulletin or you can find it on page 555 in your pew Bible. Uh, verses 8 and 9, they're difficult to translate, but they focus on oppression, probably showing how the love of money, the pursuit of money, often leads those in power to take advantage of the poor. And then chapter 5, verses 10 to 17, we get into the focus of loving money and how it does not satisfy. And it lists reasons why it does not satisfy. Then skip ahead to chapter 6 and the same theme of how money does not satisfy. And in between there, chapter 5, verses 18 to 20, sandwiched between these passages about the futility of loving money, we have a call, once again in this book, to enjoy God's gifts. Chapter 5, verses 18 to 20 show us again that it is possible with God's help to enjoy money and material possessions even though they can never satisfy us. So we're going to read the entire passage and then we'll unpack it together. Follow along as I read Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 8 through the end of chapter 6. If you see in a province the oppression of the poor and the violation of justice and righteousness, do not be amazed at the matter, for the high official is watched by a higher, and there are yet higher ones over them. But this is gain for a land in every way, a king committed to cultivated fields. He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves wealth with his income. This also is vanity. When goods increase, they increase who eat them. And what advantage has their owner but to see them with his eyes? Sweet is the sleep of a laborer, whether he eats little or much, but the full stomach of the rich will not let him sleep. There is a grievous evil that I have seen under the sun. Riches were kept by their owner to his hurt, and those riches were lost in a bad venture. And he's the father of a son, but he has nothing in his hand. As he came from his mother's womb, he shall go again. Naked as he came... And shall take nothing for his toil that he may carry away in his hand. This is also is a grievous evil. Just as he came, so shall he go. And what gain is there to him who toils for the wind? Moreover, all his days he eats in darkness, in much vexation and sickness and anger. Behold, what I have seen to be good and fitting is to eat and drink and find enjoyment in all the toil with which one toils under the sun the few days of his life that God has given him. For this is his lot. Everyone also to whom God has given wealth and possessions and power to enjoy them and to accept his lot and rejoice in his toil, this is the gift of God. For he will not much remember the days of his life because God keeps him occupied with joy in his heart. There is an evil that I have seen under the sun, and it lies heavy on mankind. A man to whom God gives wealth, possessions, and honor, so that he lacks nothing of all that he desires. Yet God does not give him power to enjoy them, but a stranger enjoys them. 
This is vanity. It is a grievous evil. If a man fathers a hundred children and lives many years so that the days of his years are many, but his soul is not satisfied with life's good things and he also has no burial, I say that a stillborn child is better off than he. For it comes in vanity and goes in darkness, and in darkness its name is covered. Moreover, it has not seen the sun or known anything, yet it finds rest rather than he. Even though he should live a thousand years twice over, yet enjoy no good, do not all go to the one place. All the toil of man is for his mouth, yet his appetite is not satisfied. For what advantage has the wise man over the fool? And what does the poor man have who knows how to conduct himself before the living? Better is the sight of the eyes than the wandering of the appetite. This also is vanity and a striving after wind. Whatever has come to be has already been named, and it is known what man is, and that he is not able to dispute with one stronger than he. The more words, the more vanity. And what is the advantage to man? For who knows what is good for man while he lives the few days of his vain life, which he passes like a shadow? For who can tell man what will be after him under the sun? In this passage, we find the problem with loving money. We see that chapter 5, especially verses 10 to 17, and then also in chapter 6. That's our first main heading of two, the problem with loving money. After we look at the problem, we'll look at the solution there in those in-between verses, chapter 5, verses 18 to 20. But first, the problem with loving money. Look again at chapter 5, verse 11 and 12. When goods increase, they increase who eat them. And what advantage has their owner but to see them with his eyes? Sweet is the sleep of a laborer, whether he eats little or much, but the full stomach of the rich will not let him sleep. The problem with loving money first is that it does not make life easy. Contrary to what we might hope or expect, getting money does not, in the end, make life easy. It says when goods increase, they increase who eat them. If you get rich... If you even win the lottery, what are you going to find? You're going to find more family members, more old friends, more new friends than you could have ever hoped for. The more wealth you have, the greater number of people who want things from you, the greater number of people who will come to depend on you. Being rich costs a lot. As you acquire more property, more possessions, eventually you need to pay people to maintain it all. If you start a business, you need to hire staff. If you make investments, you need to pay people to manage those investments. And soon you are not just feeding yourself and your family. You wind up feeding a lot of other people too. And you may also find out as you grow in prosperity and wealth that your sleep is worse than it was when you had less. The promise of prosperity is that your life will be better, it will be easier, it will be simpler as you achieve more, as you acquire more. But in reality, success often complicates life and increases stress. You get the job promotion, it comes with better pay, but it also comes with more responsibility. And now you find after work, you're still thinking about work. You're still thinking about it when you go to sleep or when you wake up in the morning or maybe even during the night. I years ago met a coworker at Starbucks who had been successful and in a rising track at a bank. And he suddenly quit it all because he said, I want a job. I don't have to think about it at night. It's not just responsibility that adds stress. More money and more possessions can themselves add stress. As someone once said, more money, more problems, right? That's often true. That's often true. It's a blessing to own a car. I am thankful to be able to own a car. But then you get a car and you realize this is going to require my time, my attention, and more money because I need insurance and I need a registration. Every year 
I need to get those new tags. It surprises me every year when that comes in the mail. Time to pay. I'm going to need maintenance. It's going to need repairs. If you're a homeowner, you know that every part of your house, every room, every appliance has the potential to rob you of sleep. Things break. And even if they're not broken, some of us, if you're like me, sadly, can be bothered when things are no longer perfect. When you walk into the room and you can't help but look at where the paint is off or where the drywall's chipped or the little dents in the nice wood floor. You have to look at it. One more possession, one more thing to worry about. As the saying goes, the more things you own, the more your things own you. The problem with loving money is it does not make life easy. Another problem with loving money is that it doesn't last. Look at verses 13 to 17 again. He talks about one who, verse 13, kept riches to his own hurt. And then, verse 14, those riches were lost in a bad venture. And he's the father of a son, but he has nothing in his hand. As he came from his mother's womb, he shall go again naked as he came, and shall take nothing for his toil that he may carry away in his hand. The preacher tells an all too common tale of a man who worked hard to get his money only in time to lose it all. Now, we don't know how or why he lost his riches. It could be that he made a foolish investment. It could be that he blew it all. Or it could just be that he lost it through no fault of his own. And we all know stories, maybe even personal experiences of sudden recessions or other catastrophes in your own personal life that drain your riches so much faster than you were able to acquire them. For whatever reason, this man lost his wealth. Having money brings its problems, but losing it can bring even more. And now this man has nothing to pass on to his son. Do you remember back in chapter 4, there was the rich man, but he didn't have a son to pass on his wealth to? Well, here's a man who has a son, but he has nothing to share with him. This is life under the sun. Wealth can get us coming and going. We work and struggle to make money. We get it, and then we find that wealth alone can bring new burdens. And even after we have it, sometimes we lose it, which brings a whole new host of burdens and stresses. One author says of this man that money spoiled his life twice over, first in the getting, then in the losing. And you look at him described there in verse 17. He spends all his days eating in darkness, in much vexation and sickness and anger. There's a man who had a lot, but he lost it all. And now he is left in the dark, anxious, sick, angry. The more that we have, sadly, the more we have to lose. The more that we possess, the more the threat of loss hangs over us. A poor man may enjoy a certain sense of freedom because, hey, what do I have to lose? But a rich man is likely to be anxious because he's got a lot to lose. The higher you rise, the further you can fall. Tim Keller uh, wrote about the economic recession in 2008 and how it was the most devastating for those who had the most, for those who had risen to the top. The acting chief financial officer of Freddie Mac, the Federal Home Loan Mortgage Corporation, hanged himself in his basement. The chief executive of Sheldon Good, a real estate auction firm, shot himself in the head behind the wheel of his Jaguar. A French money manager who invested the wealth of many of Europe's royal and leading families who had lost $1.4 billion of his client's money in the Bernie Madoff Ponzi scheme, slit his wrists and died in his Madison Avenue office. A Danish senior executive high up in a bank hanged himself in the wardrobe of his London apartment that cost him more than $20,000 a month in rent. We ask, are we sure we want this? Are we sure we want to rise to the top? 
Now, maybe if you do, it will go better for you than for these people. Maybe you'll get what you want and you'll avoid recessions. Maybe you'll be lucky enough to preserve your wealth until you die. But ultimately, you're going to lose it then. You can't take it with you. Naked and empty-handed, we come into the world. Naked and empty-handed, we go out of the world. Verse 16 restates that question. Uh, First offered up in chapter 1, verse 3, what gain is there in all of this? There's no gain. There's nothing you can get your hands around and hold on to. What are you striving to gain in this life? What are you looking for? What are you working for in the hopes that it will make everything better? What material blessing is your heart set on? If you get it, you might get it. If you get it, how long will it last? Is it something that you can take with you when you die? The problem with loving money, it doesn't make life easy. It doesn't last. And finally, maybe most importantly, it doesn't satisfy. Really the biggest problem with loving money. It does not satisfy. Go back up to chapter 5, verse 10. A key verse in this passage. He who loves money will not be satisfied with money. Nor he who loves wealth with his income. This also is vanity. If you love money, you'll never be satisfied with it. And that's what we see illustrated in chapter 6. Let's look at those verses again. Chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. There is an evil that I've seen under the sun, and it lies heavy on mankind. A man to whom God gives wealth, possessions, and honor, so that he lacks nothing of all that he desires. Yet God does not give him power to enjoy them, but a stranger enjoys them. This is vanity. It is a grievous evil. If a man fathers a hundred children... And lives many years so that the days of his years are many. But his soul is not satisfied with life's good things. And he also has no burial. I say that a stillborn child is better off than he. For it comes in vanity and goes in darkness. And in darkness its name is covered. Moreover, it has not seen the sun or known anything. Yet it finds rest rather than he. Even though he should live a thousand years twice over. Yet enjoy no good. Do not all go to the one place. Imagine being that man described in verse 2. You get wealth, possessions, honor, fame, and fortune. You lack nothing of all that you desire. Your wish list is met to the last item, but you can't enjoy it. You're still not happy. Someone else may benefit from and enjoy your success, but you can't fully enjoy it. What a tragedy. What vanity. A preacher talks about a man who has a a hundred children, which is a mark of untold blessing. The biblical view is that children are a blessing from the Lord. And so those original readers would have recognized this is someone who is blessed beyond belief. And he also has a long life. But his soul is not satisfied with life's good things. What's more depressing than not getting what you've always wanted? Getting it and finding it doesn't satisfy. It's not what you had hoped. How many people look back on life and say, that's not what I had hoped it would be. Peter Kraft uh, says, the rich know from experience that riches do not make them happy. The poor can still believe this lie. If you still have something that you especially want out in front of you, you could be subject to this lie. The preacher says, shockingly, that a stillborn child is better off. Being stillborn, you would have no chance to see or experience the world But for the rich man in this life who finds no satisfaction in God and in his gifts, everything he gains, he eventually loses. You acquire only to lose. You build up only to fall down. You can't find satisfaction or rest in what you have. And so he says, 
They're all going to end up in the same place. Better to just be at rest. Better to never have been born and experience a restless, unsatisfying life. Look what he says about the appetite, something he talked about way back at the beginning of chapter 1. In verse 7, he says, All the toil of man is for his mouth, yet his appetite is not satisfied. Or again in verse 9, Better is the sight of the eyes than the wandering of the appetite. This also is vanity and a striving after wind. Appetites, as we saw, keep coming back. We consume, but we're never filled. We get and we get and we get. We acquire more, but we never arrive at the destination where we have complete satisfaction. Are you fully satisfied in your life? Are you content with what you have? Or do you feel like you will be content, you'll be more content as soon as you get that thing that's top of your list? Speaking of which, have you made your Christmas list yet? Uh, I have had multiple people in my household who have shown me Christmas lists. We're just a couple weeks into fall, but we've got Christmas lists. Now, of course, on a Christmas list, you only write down the things, the toys that you don't have, right? Obviously. Because this is a list of things you want because you don't yet have them. It's not common for us to make a list of the things we have. Instead, we list out the things we want next. But you think back on things that you wanted and then you got them. Maybe a gift you received, maybe a, a toy you were so hoping to get and then you got it. Maybe a relationship or a job or a house you wanted. Now that you have it, are you fully satisfied in it? If you're not fully satisfied, by having gotten what you wanted then, what is it that makes you so sure that you will be satisfied when your next desire is met? The scripture tells us there's just going to be another appetite. You'll enjoy it for a time, but you won't be fully satisfied and you'll want more. Verses 10 to 12, um, the preacher says basically, again, in, in typical Ecclesiastes fashion, this is how it is. This is life. It is what it is. We get good things, but not enough to be satisfied. And if you try to make sense of it all, good luck. This is a problem you can't fix. He says there in verse 12, Who knows what is good for man while he lives the few days of his vain life, which he passes like a shadow? For who can tell man what will be after him under the sun? If you're looking for ultimate answers about meaning, about destiny, why are we here, where is this all going? If you're looking for that, you will not find it in this life. If you want to make sense of this life, you need transcendent truth. You need wisdom from above. And that is what, again, breaks through the clouds, so to speak, in chapter 5, verses 18 through 20. In between these passages that tell us how worthless money is, as a means to fulfill us, the preacher points us to another way. He points us to a solution. The problems of loving money are many. The solution is this. Don't love money, just enjoy it. Don't love material blessings and possessions, the things of this life. Just enjoy them. Look at those verses again. Behold, what I have seen to be good and fitting is to eat and drink and find enjoyment in all the toil with which one toils under the sun, the few days of his life that God has given him, for this is his lot. Everyone also to whom God has given wealth and possessions and power to enjoy them and to accept his lot and rejoice in his toil, this is the gift of God. For he will not much remember the days of his life because God keeps him occupied with joy in his heart. Everything good in your life, every thing that you've ever had is a gift from a generous God. Food, drink, 
the work you have to do each day, your money, your possessions, and even the ability, the power to enjoy them. Did you see that here? The contrast in these verses with the man in chapter 6. The man in chapter 6 has everything he's ever wanted, yet God does not give him the power to enjoy it. But here he holds out hope in chapter 5. We get a limited list of good things from God that he decides, whatever is our lot, and he gives us the ability, the power to enjoy them. We are dependent on God at every point. We need him, we know from the Lord's Prayer, we need him to give us each day our daily bread, and we need him to give us each day the ability to appreciate and enjoy and savor the daily bread that he provides. He makes strawberries and he makes them delicious. If for some strange reason you don't like strawberries, you can put another food item in your mind. He makes strawberries delicious. And yet, if he did not also give us taste buds, we would not be able to taste and enjoy and savor them. And when God does this, when he gives us good things, which he does again and again and again, and when he gives us the ability, the power to enjoy them, we can be happy. We can find joy even as we live in a world like ours a broken, a fallen world that is marked by evil and suffering. I think that's what verse 20 is talking about. It says, uh, he will not much remember the days of his life because God keeps him occupied with joy in his heart. By God's grace, people who have experienced terrible things in this life can look back on their lives and have the mindset of, you know, it was a good life. There were hard things, but the things that stand out, the things I remember most, that's the joy that God gave me in himself and in his gifts. That's possible. That is the living testimony of so many Christians in the world. And as we saw way back in chapter 2, this is what God wants for us. He wants us to enjoy his gifts. He is not honored by asceticism. You know what asceticism is? That's where we deny material blessings. We say, no, 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 those things are are bad. They're evil. I need to focus on spiritual things, not physical material. We say, no, listen, he is actually glorified in enjoying what he's given us. Our mistake is not when we enjoy money or the things that it can buy. We go wrong when we take it and we try to hold on to it and we consume it And we forget about God who gave it to us. How do you want others to respond when you give them a gift? You don't want them to to throw it away or say, oh, that's, that's a temptation to me. That's evil. You also wouldn't want them to love that gift so much that they obsess over it. Or they even take that gift and use it as a replacement for you in their life. No, you want them to enjoy it as a gift from you. You imagine kids finding presents before it's time to open them. Maybe you've been one of those kids. Uh, Imagine if you went down, uh, you know, the day or night before Christmas or a birthday and you found a pile of gifts and, and they just tore into the whole pile and they don't even bother to look at the tag to see who the gifts are from. They just look to the gift and they think of themselves with no thought or appreciation for the giver. They're treating the gifts like they just appeared out of thin air for them to consume. I think this is the difference between these three verses and the passages on either side. Two different approaches to money and possessions. Consuming as if it's all about me or enjoying as an expression of God's goodness. Up in chapter 5, verse 10, the warning is not against having money or enjoying what it can buy. The danger is in loving it, in setting your heart on it. What is it right now that has most captured your attention, your affection? What in all the world do you want most? 
What do you think will make you happy? That's the thing that is vying to be your master. Even right now, it, it could be functioning as your Lord. And, and we need to see this because maybe we hear somewhat familiar ideas and say, yes, I know I should love God more than money. Yes, I agree. But do you see how much is at stake if we don't? Think of Jesus' words. He said, no one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. This is a matter of service, of worship, and of love. Those all go hand in hand. And he says, if you love money, in the end, you actually hate God. We need to get our loves in the right order. And we need to do this now for the sake of our souls. We could, we could think of the future and the present. We need to get this, this right, this love in the right order for the sake of our future heavenly eternal joy and for the sake of our present earthly joy. Let's think about both of those in turn. Loving God above money is key first to your salvation, your eternal heavenly joy, because in the end, money and possessions are all going to fade away. And when you face the judge of all the earth, what you own in this life is not going to matter. It's going to do you zero good. If, if you're new with us or haven't been in church for a while, uh, or you just know yourself not to be a Christian, uh, recognize what the Bible teaches about God and you and the gifts he's given you. God is the one who made us and he made us to know him and to enjoy him and in enjoying him to enjoy his creation forever. But starting way back at the beginning with Adam and Eve and continuing through to each one of us, we aren't okay with that. It's not good enough for us. We're like greedy kids where we take all his gifts, we use them, we consume them, and we forget about him. We all have disobeyed his good and loving commands. And in so many ways, we've rebelled against him. We've said, thank you, we will take all of this and ignore you. Well, the well-deserved punishment for our rebellion is death, an eternal death where we are cut off from God's goodness, where we experience his very well-deserved just wrath. That's why Jesus came. When Jesus came, it wasn't just to, to be a good example of how to be a loving person. Jesus came as God in the flesh. And because he was God and man, as he remains today, he was good in all the ways that we're not. He loved God the Father. He always put him first. He died to pay the punishment, not for his sins, but for our sins. To, to buy and purchase forgiveness for anyone who would ever trust in him, believe on him for salvation. He rose from the dead to deliver us from the grip of death so that we could enjoy God's goodness, not just for a time, not just for a season, but forever. If you trust in this Jesus today to save you, if you turn away from every other master and bow to him as Lord, you will be saved. You will enter into the eternal joy of God. But when we love money above God, when we live for the things of this life, we are treating them as Lord instead of treating Christ as Lord. And money and possessions, unlike Jesus, are powerless to save. Martin Luther, uh, the German reformer 500 years ago, true to form, made fun of money. He mocked an inanimate object. And he said, what a lousy false god money is. He said, what sort of god is it that is not even capable of defending himself against moths and rust? That this is a lousy savior. Money and possessions could actually keep you from salvation because in the end, you cannot serve two masters. You can only really love one Lord. 
Money also, secondly, can rob us of contentment today. Loving God over money is key not only to future heavenly joy, but also to present earthly joy. Think about those little boys with the the Superman pajamas. What was so dissatisfying to them? Well, they were hoping for so much more. They had their hearts set on flying. What makes us so dissatisfied with the things that we have, with wealth and possessions? Oh, we were hoping that they would do so much more for us. We were hoping that they would fulfill us, that they would make life worth living. But that's not what money is there for. That's not what possessions are made to do. They are made to be received as a gift from a good and generous God, not ever to replace him. So we can say, as we said a few weeks ago, we need to let God be God and his gifts be gifts. Don't set your heart on these things, just enjoy them. What is your heart set on? What do you daydream about when your mind doesn't have to be anywhere? What are you most afraid of losing because you can't imagine life without it? What do you think you need to make you happy? And do you think that that thing could make you happy even apart from God? Uh, If you're honest and and you had to choose a future, an eternity, with God or with that thing, would that be a hard choice for you? We need to get our loves in the right order. God above all and every created thing under him as a gift from him. A gift that we love and enjoy as coming from God, an extension of our love from God, but one that we know we could live without if he never gave it to us or if he gave it to us for a time and then took it away. When we get our loves in the right order, then our desires for money and stuff may still remain, but they'll be at a lower level, at an appropriate level where we can say, you know, it would be great to have it. But if that's not what God has for me, I know I can live without it. I know I can trust him. He knows what's best. You know, some have said, uh, really, there are two ways to be joyful in life and content with what you have. One way, if your desires are up here, is to raise your possessions to the level of your desires. Now, that's hard to do. But as we've already seen this morning, even if we get there, it doesn't work. Because we continue to focus on what we don't have. We forget to enjoy what we do have. We fixate on the Christmas list. We forget the things, the toys we got last year. And even when we get it all, it doesn't satisfy. But an old Puritan, Jeremiah Burroughs said, the Christian has another way of contentment. The opposite way. He can bring his desires down to meet his possessions. This second way to contentment really works every time. When by God's grace, I can bring my desires down to the level of my possessions and receive all of it as a gift from God. Maybe what we need to do is to stop or pause making lists, not just Christmas lists, but mental lists of the next things that we want. And instead... List out things that we have, things we enjoy, things like Jeff led us to pray about earlier this morning, like fresh coffee to sip or a pillow to lay your head on, comfortable shoes to wear, sweaters to keep you warm. We could go on and on. This room, this room where we can come together and see each other and be together and hear each other singing that just last year was really difficult to do. We can thank God and enjoy each of his gifts. Maybe that's a good place to start. At the end of each day, to to pause before the Lord, take a moment and list two or three things, good things that you recognize and acknowledge and say back to him, these are gifts from you. Father, thank you for giving this gift and for giving me the power to enjoy it. I think that will honor the Lord and it will likely increase your enjoyment of that gift. Why not start that tonight? 
at the top of every Christian's list is that God has given us himself. The Father sent the Son to die for our sins so that we can be forgiven and we can be reconciled to God. He sent the Spirit so that we can be indwelt by the Spirit of God and enjoy unending, constant communion with God. He has given us himself as our Father. That's what we're going to fix our thoughts on as we celebrate the Lord's Supper. Gus is going to lead us in doing that. Uh, Before he does, why not take a moment right now to silently before the Lord thank him for the gifts he's given you. Friends, as we gather around uh, the table this morning, let me remind you what we're doing. We are simply obeying the Lord Jesus' commands to his church uh, to gather uh, in remembrance of him and his great sacrifice for us. That's what we are doing as a church this morning. That's what we're doing as members of this church. We are about to commit ourselves again to loving the Lord Jesus, uh, to loving each other, uh, and to do so in a time of remembrance of what the Lord has done for us. Uh, If you are a visiting member from another local church where you uh, hear the same gospel as was preached this morning, a gospel of free grace, a gospel that focuses on Christ dying in the place of sinners, Uh, if that's uh, your only hope in life and death, if you are freely admitted to that table at your local church, then you're welcome to join us uh, this morning. We're glad to have you here. Uh, If you are not a Christian, Uh, If for some reason you can't understand how a holy God can love and embrace wicked people like you and I, uh, if you have not yet uh, publicly declared your faith in the Lord Jesus uh, and to follow him in the company of his church, uh, then I would ask that you let the elements pass you by. Uh, Don't leave. Stay with us, however. And uh, let me invite you to use the time to think about what you've heard, uh, to think about what you see here a picture of the infinite God who came into this world as a human being to treat us far, far better than our sins deserve. If you are planning uh, as uh, a believer to participate in the table, I want to remind you of who uh, who our God is and more particularly who he calls us to be. 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 15 says, but as he who called you is holy, you also should be holy in all your conduct. The God that we love is a holy God and he calls us to live uh, lives that become a Christian. The truth is that we don't. So I'm gonna lead us now in a prayer of confession. I invite you to bow your heads as uh, we pray uh, together. O Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him, and keeps his commandments. We have sinned and have done wrong and acted wickedly and rebelled. Lord, we have turned aside from your many commandments. Father, as we reflect even over this last week, perhaps over uh, even this morning, we, we recognize that we so easily, so quickly fail to do the things that you command us to do The very things you call call us to stay away from, these things we we find ourselves doing. So again, we confess that we are rightly called uh, those who have uh, sin-stained hands and eyes and hearts. Father, we confess this morning particularly our love for money. 
Oh Lord, we can so quickly put our hope and our trust in uh, this thing that we know is money. We so easily believe the lie of the world that more stuff, more things on the bucket list, that this is the way to eternal life. Lord, forgive us for the way that we are stingy with our money, lacking a generous spirit, uh, being slow to bless others, being slow to fund the gospel work, even at this church. Father, forgive us uh, for uh, thinking uh, that one day, once we have accumulated enough, that then we will be happy. Oh Lord, we confess again that what we need above all is uh, the Lord Jesus Christ and the fullness of His Spirit. And we pray again this morning that you would assure us, Lord Jesus, of your great love for us. And we pray that this love, that the knowledge of this love would change us, would change us uh, even in the way that we relate to each other, would change us even in the way that we relate to our money. We ask all these things now in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, though we are people with stained hands, uh, we are not defined by these things in God's sight. Uh, we are perfectly righteous. Listen to these words of assurance and hope from 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21. For our sake, God made him, that's Jesus, to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And that's how we eat this morning, as those who are perfectly righteous in God's sight, by faith in the Lord Jesus. Now, as you are served the bread, please do hold onto it until all have been served, and then we will uh, eat together.
Paul mentions to the Corinthians, the Apostle Paul, For I received from the Lord what I also passed unto you. The night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Eat this in remembrance of me. Let's eat together now. Again, as we are now served the cup, I ask you that you would hold on to it until we've all been served, um, so we can drink together. Uh, and this time that we have around the this, this supper is rightly a solemn time. It's also a joyful time. So I'm going to invite you to stand and sing this time the hymn, Behold the Lamb. sins away slain for us and we remember the promise made that all who come in faith find forgiveness at the cross and so we share in this bread body of our Savior Jesus Christ torn for you. Eat and remember the wounds that heal, that death that brings us life. Pay the price to make us one. And so we share Is every stain of sin shed for you? Drink and remember, He drained us cup that all may enter in to receive the life of God. And so we share.
bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's drink this cup in light of his coming. Sing doxology. Praise God. You are dismissed.